Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Weather's Connection to the Farm. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Any unanswered questions will be answered afterward via email. Now on to Ann Gillespie, Director of Impact Acceleration with Textile Exchange. Ann? Thank you, Rose, and welcome everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be having this webinar. It's a fantastic way for the brands to connect back to what's happening on the farm at the source of all the leather. So I Really looking forward to hearing from our speakers and learning about the way that cattle are raised all around the world. And hopefully this will be the start of a long relationship from the two ends of the supply chain. So I have a quick overview of the speakers. I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of the Leather Impact Accelerator. Then we have Pablo Borelli, who is a co-founder of Ovis 21 and the uh, EOV, and he will explain what that means, Program Manager at Savory Institute. I'm really excited about the EOV program. Then we have Charton Locks, Associate Founder and CEO of Alianza de Terra. Charton has been working with us for years now, uh, talking about leather and, and opportunities for the Leather Impact Accelerator. Mariano Salerno, who is with the ACD or ACDI, with, and is the Director of Sustainable Products Development. We'll be talking about their, their initiative down in South America. I'm very, very keen to learn about that. And finally, we have Kaylee Segbor, who is a certification framework manager of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. So as you can see, we've got a good tour around the world and uh, hopefully the, we'll have a balanced view of what's possible. So a few words about the Textile Exchange Initiative, which is the Leather Impact Accelerator. And what it is, is a framework that holds together all of the different tools, programs, and initiatives into a single framework that is held together by essentially the claims that can be made mm -hmm. and the processes that we use to connect them. And this gives brands a way to send clear messages down their supply chain about their expectations on everything from the way the cattle are, are farmed through to the way the leather is produced. We have a number of components at the farm level. We have a deforestation conversion free protocol, which looks is based on a zero gross deforestation um, target uh, based on a January 20th, sorry, January 1st, 2020 deadline. We have the animal welfare benchmark, which is a four tiered benchmark that is quite flexible that it can adapt to the kind of the best needs of the individual regions. We have leather production benchmarks that address both social and environmental compliance. We have the impact incentives, which are a way that brands can leapfrog the whole supply chain very efficiently and deliver their incentives, financial incentives to the farms that are meeting the DCF and or the animal welfare and then be able to make claims. The claims framework is what really drives the value and ensures that everything is credible. And then we've got traceability guidelines, which are built in because one of the long, longer term goals of LEA is to build a traceable supply network so that brands can ultimately source back to the farms that they've been supporting through the impact incentives. So this tool is, an optional tool. We hope that it will gain a lot of momentum. And one of the uh, one of the benefits of this webinar is that as brands, you will have a better understanding of what's happening at the farms. And these are all projects we could eventually connect you to through the impact incentives. So that's it for me. And I'm going to pass it right over to Pablo. Pablo, please go Hello. ahead and advance the slides. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Textile Exchange, for this great opportunity to connect with brands. I am Pablo Borelli uh, with my partner, Richard Fenton. We founded Always 21 uh, 17 years ago, and we are now uh, the Argentine hub for 
uh, the Savory Network, and I am the project manager, manager for EOB at the Savory Institute. Um, and also, we are a, um, a certified B Corp. Yes, sorry, go to the next, please. Uh, well, this is it's a, a very unusual, I would say, unique situation here, talking in the middle of a pandemia. Uh, in Argentina, we are still in quarantine for a long time, nine, three months. And, um, and we see this uh, as a kind of a rehearsal of what, what may happen at a, a global scale uh, when we face um, climate change and, and, and worldwide uh, land degradation as a, as a big crisis. Uh, next. Next slide, please. So uh, this is, um, why do we see this? Well, we are seeing that in the, in the middle of a pandemia, a lot of decisions were made in, in the middle of an emergency in a hurry. And you see that things that you may never thought that could happen, they happened. And, um, and we, they, they made the world stop for uh, such a long time and, and, and a lot of changes. This is the, carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the, in the atmosphere is measured with a very, very uh, objective uh, sensor there. And you see that um, CO2 is, is reaching 415 uh, parts per million. And um, that means that we are only 34 parts per million to the disruption, disruption point for climate, which is uh, increasing two degrees, uh, the temperature of the planet. And uh, thinking that we are increasing 2.5 ppms per year, that means that we have only four years, let's say less than two decades time from that global crisis. So, um, while coronavirus was unexpected and it was kind of a random situation, climate change uh, crisis is totally predictable because we know at which rate we are reaching that disruption point. So it's, like, it's about 14 years. So the next please. So livestock production has been charged accused by being part of the problem. And that is true to some extent, because I would say almost 14% of global emissions come from uh, livestock production systems across the world. So that's true. But livestock production could not be uh, analyzed as a whole thing, as a, as a thing that is homogeneous. Uh, here, and in this simple table, I, I'm, I'm trying to characterize livestock production be, be, uh, uh, across productivity levels, could be high or low, and input levels, high or low. And most of the livestock production in the world is what we call extensive, which is low input, low output, and you have, uh, yeah, three quarters, three quarters of the grasslands of the world unmanaged in this way, in which a lot of degradation, desertification has been taken on and a very low production in which uh, you, you know that um, you, can, you cannot hold people on, at the land with these systems. And in fact, in Patagonia, we have 30% of the farms closed because of the failure of this uh, model that has a lot of land degradation inside. So, uh, and we, we have learned from for decades that the, the school, the mindset was, if you put more things to, to, the, to the land, you get more production. So th then we become to see more intensive approaches and um, a whole package of technology came to, to, pr to put um, new species, new forage species, supplements, fertilizers, herbicides, uh, all, all um, artillery of things that you can do to increase production. And it does it uh, 
indeed, but uh, also you increase, um, you increase the cost because you have higher input level. And when you do that, you, in many times, you increase the carbon footprint of production. And if you put intensification to, to, to the edge, you get industrial livestock production, production CAFOs, uh, confined animals, uh, which are, uh, have lost any connection with the land. And, um, and when we talk about the negative impact of livestock production systems, probably these three that I have mentioned get into that. And there is a possibility of high production with low input, and it, it, it should be called magic. A uh, couple of years ago, we, we thought that that couldn't happen, but that's with a new paradigm, some things that are impossible for an old paradigm, they are totally possible for a new paradigm. So that's regenerative livestock production. I'll go to the next. Thank you. So, uh, what, how do you get regenerative livestock production? Well, first of all, you need to change, change your mindset, yet the way you make decisions, and that's coming from reductionist management to holistic management. The second thing is to promote perennial species with, with a great biodiversity. And we promote natural soil fertility through fungal, biologically active soils, try to incorporate trees in the landscape or keep trees in the landscape if you have them already. And that means uh, a tendency to go to silvopastoral systems and, and maximize photosynthesis with ample carbon pulses to, to promote liberally the maximization of photosynthesis. Next one. So, uh, so different from, from other words like natural, sustainable, that are a little bit vague, a little bit ambiguous, uh, regeneration uh, can, be, can be described with very objective indicators. So uh, a system is regenerative it, if it's increasing or maintaining a high, a high cover of the soil with perennial vegetation, mainly, if it increases water infiltration and retention in the soil, if it increases biodiversity, photosynthesis and soil carbon. So those things can be measured so we can tell objectively if someone is regenerating or not. Next one. So this is what EOV does. EOV is a, uh, is a metric that the Sabre Institute has launched across all the hubs in, in, the, in five continents. And uh, we can measure regeneration. Let's see in this example, you, you, we, we in EOV, we track biodiversity. At the same time, we track uh, infiltration rates and water retention, and we track uh, carbon stocks. So we can show, uh, we can tell objectively if someone's regenerating or not. And, uh, and we have um, an, account, an accounting of the, the environmental services. Go to the next, please. And this is just visual um, regeneration. Uh, you see, this is Patagonia. This is Rio Negro, uh, shrubs and bare ground, as you can see. And this is what happened after holistic plant grazing. Next one. Next, next slide, please. Yes, this is deep, profound changes in the way the landscape looks because of better decision making using livestock as a tool to regenerate land. Uh, the, the, the changes in this, in this landscape have been so profound. Go to the next, please. And um, the thing is that here in the left you have, this is from, from a study that the, the Quantis uh, consultants did for white dog pastures. This is the comparison of 
the uh, life cycle analysis for conventional beef in US, pork, chicken, um, soy ham hamburgers, and the soy itself, and white dog pastures beef. And this is a very exhaustive um, the life cycle analysis that takes into account carbon sequestration. And then you can see here that um, we have uh, a, net, a, a, a net sequestration of carbon of 3.5 kilograms of CO2 per, uh, per kilogram of meat. And this, we could do the same account with leather or with wool. So um, regenerative livestock production, it, is, it means that you're taking out carbon for each unit of product that you sell. No one of these proteins can claim that. So that's the big difference and that's the big opportunity. And um, what we say is that when, when we get to a global crisis, this will be very, very important. Next one, please. So that's why uh, we as a network in the Saber Institute have this program, Land to Market, which is helps the brands to find um, verified regenerative sourcing solutions. So it's not talking regeneration, it's uh, contacting a network of, of farmers that are practicing regenerative management and measuring it. And the Savory Institute does the quality assurance of this. Go to the next, please. So thank you very much. The, I think that uh, the, the idea is that um, there are sourcing solutions that can help your brands to purchase um, raw materials that bring not only a story, but a, a really an accounting of uh, doing good to the land. And that's something that uh, means a win-win situation, but all, all, all the planet and all, all the value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo. That was fantastic. And we're going to go straight into Charton. Go ahead, Charton. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Annie, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here talking about uh, cattle production in Brazil. Uh, let me introduce. Uh, I'm Charton Locks. I'm the Chief Operation Officer of Aliança da Terra. It's a Brazilian company, and I'm uh, an environmental engineer. And I will I will try to share with uh, everyone a little bit about uh, the challenges to produce cattle in Brazil. So next one, please. Okay. So first, uh, uh, an overview about uh, Brazilian cattle production. So we are the second large largest herd in the world. We have more than two hundred million heads. Uh, we are the third beef producers in the world. We represent 15% of uh, global production. And the cattle production, it's a very important sector for Brazilian economy. It represents 80.7% of Brazilian GDP. Uh, in the graph, uh, you can see uh, how cattle production in Brazil is changing over the years. So uh, this graph represents the reduction of pasture land the pasture area in Brazil since 19, uh, and the increase of beef production at the same time. So we reduce in 30 years, uh, more than 30 million hectares of pasture land. So that area was uh, released to agriculture, to reforestation, to other uh, activities. And we increase uh, the cattle production, we, uh, by fourfold uh, during these uh, 30 years, uh, just uh, using technologies and better land management. So next one, please. Uh, well, uh, the, the graph is not, uh, uh, we have some problem with the slide, but uh, in Brazil, uh, we have more than 42% of the country uh, under a conservation area, the native vegetation. So there's a lot of area preserved in Brazil. Uh, and less than 20% of Brazil is pasture land. 
So it's important to have these numbers in mind because uh, some people think that uh, Brazil is, is it's a, just a big pasture land area and it's not. Uh, we have a lot of area preserved and a, a big amount of this area is preserved under private properties. So producers which uh, raise cattle and keep the forest stand. Uh, next one. But uh, it's not only flowers, right? Uh, Brazil, Brazil faced a big problem with deforestation, uh, mainly in the Amazon region. So since 2012, uh, we see a growth trend of deforestation in Brazil. Uh, this year, uh, 2020, looks like it will be higher than 2019, which is it's a real problem. Uh, but one thing important when we talk about deforestation in Amazon, uh, it's, uh, it's not only for cattle production. Uh, so Brazilian people, it's not expanding uh, the pasture area in the Amazon. So uh, in, in, in fact, uh, the, the major drive of deforestation in Brazil, it's land speculation. So people which see in the forest an opportunity to make money. And so this kind of people, they are not producer, but they are affecting the image of all other producers in Brazil, right? So all the producers in Brazil uh, receive a bad label, uh, a label of uh, people which don't care with the environment, but it's not true. Uh, just an example, if uh, all the area, the four states since 2012 to 2019 becomes pasture, which, which is not because uh, 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 we have data pro proving it, uh, it represents only 3% of uh, an increase in pasture land in Brazil. So it's a small amount of increase. Uh, and uh, so even all this area become pasture land. We have more than 96% of cattle producers in Brazil doing the right thing, right? So less than 3% is doing the wrong thing. Uh, it's important to have it in mind. Uh, next one, please. So Brazilian cattle producers change, uh, face a lot of challenges, right? Uh, the reputational problems, as I mentioned before, because as we have deforestation in Amazon, all the productive sector in Brazil is uh, bad label. Uh, we have one other big problem, which is market concentration. So uh, just th three big companies uh, <clears throat> concentrate almost the entire cattle uh, production in Brazil, the industry, right? And in Brazil, we have something that we call Brazilian cost because uh, Despite the fact that we are a rich country, we have a huge uh, social inequality uh, and, and we don't have investments to improve uh, the life quality of every Brazilian citizen uh, all over the country. So we have poor people invading land in the Amazon to uh, have a piece of land to produce or someone just to make easy money. Uh, we have lack of governance. So uh, people with guns <laughs> uh, 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 kicking off producers from their lands. Uh, we have problems with roads. Uh, we don't have railroads or just a small uh, amount of railroads. We have huge problems with fires and fire uh, affects cattle production uh, in a deeply way because when you lost your pasture, uh, you need to sell your cattle cheaper. You need to rent another pasture land. Uh, you need to move for a feedlot, which increase your cost. So uh, some people believe that the, 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 the cattle producers put fire in their pasture, but it, it, it's not a, 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 a true. Uh, so we have, yes, we have some people doing that, but the vast majority, they are trying to protect their pasture because they need to raise their cattle there. Uh, next one. So even with all that challenge, how people decide to become producers, uh, 
why to uh, work in this kind of environment and, and face so many challenges? It's because it's amazing. Uh, I'm suspected to, to, to tell you because I'm a producer in Brazil and uh, it's a lifestyle uh, and has many advantages. Fresh air, wildlife, uh, the happiness of knowing that you were producing food for many people, uh, raise your kids in this kind of landscape is amazing. So yes, they are really special people. The producers in Brazil, they are really special people, mostly. Uh, next one. But when we talk about uh, cattle production in Brazil, uh, the cattle producers, it's not the same. We, we have a, a, a range of producers. We have small ranchers, we have big ones, we have indigenous ranches. Uh, and any, any one of them uh, face different challenges to become more sustainable. Uh, but, but one thing it's important for all of them is technical assistance in sustainability. Uh, in Brazil, we have a lot of uh, regulations, laws uh, that need to be followed by, by those producers. But it's really hard to understand because uh, it, we have laws every day, new laws, and uh, the laws change. So uh, the producers, uh, sometimes they are lost uh, trying to uh, adequate their properties uh, in a, this, this insane uh, reality. But uh, I think they are doing a good job. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I bring one case that my company works on. Uh, so we, we start to help uh, a small amount of producers, so 43 ranchers uh, in, in Brazil, mostly in the Amazon region, uh, to become more sustainable. And well, those producers together manage more than half a million hectares, which is a really huge area. And, and they protect more uh, almost 200,000 hectares of area. So it represents more than one, 100 million trees uh, that they are under their protection. Uh, and this project uh, become viable because we made a partnership with the two, two of the most major retailers in Brazil uh, and they are supporting those producers uh, with technical assistance. Uh, my, my company provides the technical assistance to that producers. And with uh, a small premium for the beef. Uh, so those producers have some targets to reach. And if they reach those targets, they receive a small premium uh, based on their performance. And this, even, even a small premium help a lot to those producers. So, just to let you know some results uh, from 2019. Uh, even considering that Amazon was a hell last year, fire everywhere, we have no fires into those properties. So we prepare all those properties for the fire season, uh, building fire breaks, training the employees to, to fire combat, uh, and uh, so no fire. So all those producers uh, commit to zero illegal deforestation. So no deforestation. Even a single tree was cut off into those properties. We have, we have more than a thousand people working in a safe condition into these properties. So uh, it, it's, it's a proof that it's possible to produce and preserve. And when the industry when the brands become part of the solution, uh, help producers uh, providing directions and incentive to them, they, they, they respond in an amazing way. So we can see real results in the ground. Uh, but uh, just an example, uh, it's, as I said before, it's not only flowers. Oh, uh, those producers need almost $3 million to 
full adequacy of those properties. So they are taking small steps into sustainability uh, and they are doing it very good. Uh, and it's a kind of opportunity to engage other uh, participants. Uh, as an example, uh, companies which buy the ladder because we only have support for the beef industry at the moment to speed up the adequacies into the ground. Uh, uh, next one, please. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I think my final message is uh, to uh, fashion brands that uh, if you decide to know better and support your supplier, you will find the best way to help producer increasing sustainable ladder. So uh, we need to work together, uh, connecting producers and the industry and the brands uh, to really achieve uh, sustainability. Uh, so that's what I have for today. And I'm uh, here for question when it was open. Thank you so much, Charton. Beautifully presented. I'm gonna move straight into Mariano. Um, it's a tight timeline, so go ahead, Mariano. Hello, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you. I will, well, my name is Mariano. I'm part of ACDI, and I divide this presentation in three parts. First, I will present ACDI, who we are and what we do. After, I will shortly present two previous experience with livestock producers in Argentina. And at the end, I will present our main project named The Future is in the Wood, in the Forest, which take place in the Gran Chaco region of Argentina. So next one. ACDI is a non-governmental organization founded in the 90s by a group of young people in Santa Fe, Argentina. The core mission of ACDI is the development of people. We promote development of people, of people. We design and execute projects and we divide our work in three, in three areas, environment, education, and employment. So after, next one. The first experience of acting in rural areas involved a group of live pro, livestock producers. ACDI promote the creation of program. Program is an association of livestock producers that help them to increase asset market these producers transform themselves from producers to exporters. This is the main output of this project. They also could add value to their products, adopt technologies to ensure traceability, and they also could establish alliance with slaughters and exporters and other type of organization, and also access to credit. The next one. So in Agri, we never work alone. So all these projects are possible because of the partnership with other organizations, as you can see here, some foundations and uh, cooperation, international cooperation, the ADB. Uh, well, that's how to show how we work. Uh, well, the next one. Yeah, here you can see uh, the typical or traditional producers in Argentina in the north of Santa Fe and also the team of Agdi work it with them and help them to transform themselves from producers to exporter. Next one. Uh, Agri, this, is a, this is the second experience uh, linked with uh, livestock, livestock producers. Agdi was founder of the Alianza al Pastizal in English, we can say it, Grassland Alliance. This alliance gathers producers, but also organizations of the social civility and public organizations and other organizations, and promote the production, the pro promotes the production of livestock based on natural ecosystem of grassland. You know, the grass, natural grassland is the main ecosystem in the center area of Argentina. And here, a next one, a certification standard was developed in this production uh, type, uh, we increase in this production system, the biodiversity is protected and reestablished, mainly birds. So we, we can uh, check how the 
wildlife of birds increase after implementing this uh, type of system. Uh, each farm is a natural reserve of the biodiversity. Um, Carrefour, the, the supermarket, uh, use this standard certification to, to use in their own private label called Huesha Natural, and you can now find this type of products in supermarkets that promotes this type of production. Also, consumer can eat these products that are uh, in, some, in some way uh, a reserve of the biodiversity. So, please, next one. And now well, no, we will, I will present our main project that is uh, is called <coughs> The Future is in the Forest, and we work here in the Juan Chaco. So, I will introduce some data of Gran Chaco region. That is, a, is a vast area that takes place in Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Brazil, but mainly in, in the north of Argentina. It's the third largest forest in Latin America. It's the first largest dry forest in the world. It has a cultural diversity. You know, there are more than 40 different indigenous uh, communities. 8% of the population is indigenous in this part and includes Wichi, Chane, Kwom, Tapui. These are some of the names of the communities that live there. Uh, deforestation and forest degradation and climate change are the main threat, you know, the main dangers that is uh, present in this area and thus this may increase poverty. You know? So the, po the population of this area is really very vulnerable. Uh, next one. Please. So Gran Chaco challenge for livestock producers. There is livestock producer in this area. A native forest is the main natural capital in this area. A producer uh, has no water supply. It's not easy to get water. The communities are very isolated. You can see in the map the distribution of poverty and aridity. Darker colors are deeper problems of poverty. Uh, there are production of 217,000 kilos of meat yearly. And many indigenous communities here are dedicated to family farming, harvesting, fishing, and hunting, using all available resources for, from the native forest. Uh, next one. So, to end poverty in the Gran Chaco, no, this uh, project brings solution and the future is in the forest is the name of the project and it's a movement that promotes business models to stimulate competitive and sustainably development by, by enhancing the value of natural and cultural capital. No? We combine innovation with traditional knowledge. Uh, nowadays almost 5,000 people in, are involved in the future is in the forest in this project and you can see there a lot of organizations, such as for blue public and private sector, that are helping to bring solutions to this uh, area. No, next one. So to end poverty, the project brings solutions to this area, to the people of this area, because people is uh, our aim. Uh, the development of people is our core mission, as I said in the beginning, and uh, we bring business based on ecosystem models as a solution and also transversal uh, solutions. No? In the business model, there is livestock is one of them, is one of these solutions. And in transversal solution, we had water access, connectivity access, and credit access. So next one. Here is a, an example of, of how we work with this solution. We uh, help people to plan the production. We help people with facility, with infrastructure, with the production. We combine, for example, the, the harvest of a, a native tree, that is a carrot tree, that is, if it's, you process these fruits, you obtain a very good feed uh, to the animals, so we integrate the indigenous people with the traditional producers, and we also help people to get 
technologies to connect and to gain market. And in Gran Chaco, we, go, we work with big animals, as we say, that cattle or cow, and also with goats, with small animals. Um, next one. Now is one. Well, here you can see the, the photo, you can see the, the landscape, you no, know, dry wood, uh, where is the production. Uh, this area is in danger because of deforestation and degradation of the native forest. Next photo. Here you can see us working, working in training to the, with producers, training and helping them to get this type of facility to have a better quality, a better production. Next one. Well, here you can say some examples of infrastructure necessary to produce in this area, no? And the next one. Here you can see the equilibrium there is in this area with uh, wildlife and production. So you can see at the left, uh, native wildlife, that is a corzuela, and how the silvopastoral system we promote here in this area uh, is done at the, at the left, at the right. And one more. Next one. And um, regards, Transversal solutions. No, uh, we have this project inside the future is in the forest that we call a Gran Chaco Nanum Village. Gran Chaco Nanum Village is a partnership with Samsung Argentina. Uh, 20 technology centers were built to provide internet connectivity to local indigenous communities. And this connectivity promotes economic and productive development because indigenous communities can get trained and also can develop business and online business. So this is a part how we help them to develop with a transversal uh, solutions. Next one. Uh, also we have transversal solutions linked to climate change. No, we develop a three national alliance with members of the social civility, private sector, and national government. And we here, we use technology system and investment to help producers, mainly livestock and beekeeping in this case, to fight against impacts from climate change and the climate variability. The next one. And well, here, is one of other one of the last photo I, I want to, to share with you is other transversal solution. Water is a very big problem here. There is no water. You can see women uh, walking many hours to get uh, water to their family to use for human consumption, but also to to use in the production. So we help. And we develop this type of facilities to water collect. We harvest rainwater here, and we really transform the life of people. So to the, to the left and to the right, to the right you see that they can harvest their own water. They can be prepared in the dry uh, times when there is no rains for many times. They can use water, they can have water. So that's we really call that these are changes that really matters, no? And that's one of the transformation we want to do in, the, in this area uh, of the world where we are working on. So the last one is only to say thank you to you and you can contact us in this, uh, in this contact. Very, thank you. Thank you so much, Mariano. That's a fascinating presentation. And last but not least, Kaylee from Canada. Good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I really just want to say thank you, not only from the CRSB, but as someone that lives and works in the beef industry. Um, if you guys could see behind me out our window, we've got uh, 60 steers on grass here. Um, this is part of who I am, and I'm, that's why I'm so incredibly proud of the work of the Canadian Roundtable of Sustainable for sustainable and what we've done. 
um, I was asked to talk about how Canadian beef producers um, meet our criteria for environment and animal health and welfare. And for me to talk about that, I need to give you a little bit of background of what the CRSB is and how we've done things. Um, so go to the next slide here. Okay, and Kaylee, just your, your audio is going in and out a little bit. So if you could just keep very steady with the mic or whatever adjustments you can make, it'd be great. We can hear you. Up okay, good. Sorry, Anne. Um, so the CRSB is a nonprofit that was established in 2014. Um, and right after it was formed, it adopted the definition and five principles of sustainable beef from the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Next slide. Next slide. There we go. Um, and so our membership represents the entire supply chain. We have over 115 members now um, representing from the um, individual producers, um, producer organizations to our end retailers, as well as environmental organizations, um, research um, call and colleges, research groups, all of them working collaboratively to help advance sustainability here in Canada. And it is this membership that has allowed us to meet um, uh, our goals and really drive sustainability forward. Next slide. So as I talked, we have a focus on um, the five pillars. Um, and this is where frames a lot of our work, focusing on natural resources, people in the community, animal health and welfare, food, and efficiency and innovation. But with that economic viability underpinning what we do, our, our, our industry needs to be econo economically viable for it to um, continue to be, um, responsibly manage these five key areas. Next slide. So, from that um, area of work, um, the CRSB has three areas. Um, so we have our sustainability um, benchmarking, which is a national assessment of the entire supply chain um, and where we do a life cycle analysis of it. We then have our sustainability projects where we highlight the different work um, that is happening across the pro um, country to advance sustainability. So this is projects um, that are tackled those five key areas. And then finally, we have our certification framework. Um, the, the certification fr framework is a world-class farm level program to demonstrate and communicate to consumers the sustainability of the Canadian beef industry. It is the first outcome-based beef sustainability certification framework in the world and we currently have three retailers utilizing the logo and almost um, 1.4 million head of Canadian cattle raised on farms that are certified sustainable. So that represents about 13% of the Canadian beef herd. Um, the, and which is really impressive as this was developed um, and launched um, in 2017. So to have that much adoption within the industry really demonstrates how Canadian producers step it up to the plate. Uh, next slide. So we have two standards um, that outline what producers need to meet to participate in this. Um, uh, again, so we have our sustainable beef production standard that outlines on, um, under those uh, indicators under those five categories. Next slide. Um, so for each indicator in the standards, they are scored according to the system outlined in this slide. Achievement level for all indicators in the applicable standard is required for certification. One of the key components of the framework development was alignment with existing industry programs that producers may already be participating in. Um, one of which is the Verified Beef Production Plus program, um, which is now one of our third party certification bodies for the system. Um, as part of the audit um, and verification program, the auditor completes the assessment through interviews, examination of documentation, um, policies and um, looking at records and direct observation of activities related to each indicator. So next slide. So I wanted to start off with the natural resources indicators um, that we have um, as I was asked to talk to them. 
So the goal of this indicator is to ensure watershed health is maintained or enhanced and the degradation of water quality is uh, minimized. So many of the management decisions of our Canadian cattle producers we know make an impact on water, um, watershed health. So for producers to meet this minimum achievement level within this, um, the producers need to demonstrate how they're managing the riparian areas, how they're managing their wetlands, um, as well as management of potential sources of contamination. Um, here, I just wanted to also highlight for those that aren't involved directly in production and understand it, here's an example of um, one of those um, ways a producer could be managing their water with an offsite watering system that Solar run, um, ran for in pasture situations. Next slide. So again, um, so our second indicator here, soil health is maintained and advanced. Again, there's a many different ways for producers to participate um, and demonstrate um, how they're meeting this indicator. So this allows for producers across the country with a wide range of um, farm systems working in different ecosystems to participate so long as they meet the goals. So producers are going to be asked questions like stocking, how they determine stocking density, what are their grazing management plans, um, how do they make decisions um, regarding their grasses or um, uh, forage species. Um, so again, another example here, um, producer checking his grasses. Uh, next slide. Um, now moving on to our natural um, indicator three here, which is practices that support carbon sequestration and emis uh, minimizes emissions. This is an example of some of those, oh, we just jumped ahead, but this is an example of those complex ecosystems that, are, um, uh, that farm and ranches operate. And we understand that measurement on some of these concept, complex processes on farm is uh, not scientifically possible or economically feasible. Um, so what we, when we're assessing these type of indicators like this one here, we're looking at what practices they're putting in place. They might not have a tool available yet for them to measure, but what are they doing to monitor? What are they doing? So it could be um, how they're managing their grasses or um, looking at emissions. What are they using for equipment? How are they looking at reductions on that? Um, and then on the graphic here, this is from, we realize that measurements can be done on a larger scale a lot, um, a lot more readily. So the National Beef Sustainability Assessment, we know um, on their overall assessment of the Canadian beef industry, we know that um, beef helps preserve 1.5 billion tons of carbon. Next um, one. So the next indicator here is talking about air quality and again, um, and this is a requirement specific to feedlots that are participating in the program. Again, this is one that's not re necessarily feasible to measure. So we're looking um, through those questions, interviews, looking at records of how the pro um, producer can demonstrate how they're managing um, air quality um, on their local, um, in their operation and their sphere of influence. Next slide. Um, so grasslands, again, we're looking at for monitoring, um, measuring um, how they're using cover crops, um, things, uh, practices that they're um, implementing to reduce compaction and adoptional rotational grazing. And again, it depends on the type of farm, and the type of situation that they're operating in and how they demonstrate that. Next slide. Um, and then finally, on our habitat and wildlife is our final um, natural resource indicator in the framework. Um, so there's, again, we're looking at how producers can demonstrate this um, through multiple different ways. Um, and if you're a producer in Western Canada and the Rockies, it might be how they're managing elk. If you are in Eastern Canada, you're looking at how you might be taking care of some of your um, uh, woodlots and the native ecosystems there. So it to, um, and to provide um, wildlife habitat. Sorry, did we next slide here, Anne? I'm going to keep talking um, just as we need to. Yeah, well, um, is this the slide you wanted? I, you went quiet for a moment. Sorry, uh, next slide. Yeah, if we can go to the next one, Anne.
at the, the with the cuff. Oh, it, Kate, my computer's just pre um, freezing. Then it, I think it's on my end. Um, rural internet here. Anyways, to talk about our animal health and welfare. Um, Again, this CRSB did not want to duplicate some of the work that has already been done in Canada, um, in particular around the uh, national codes of practice um, for um, meat production, which are managed by the National Farm Animal Care um, Council, um, which they've gone through a really rigorous process um, working with the scientific community as well as industry to develop these codes. So we um, really relied on the beef cattle codes of practice, the veal cattle, and dairy co cattle in developing our own indicators. Um, I think if by Anne's description, we're on animal health and welfare one. So yep. now on two. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're on two. It's sorry. My slides are just. I don't get to see what you guys are seeing right now. Um, so again, we're looking. Um, producers can demonstrate um, what they're doing um, to meet this goal as it is outcome based. Um, so this is looking, so like if we look at, uh, oh, there we are. Um, cattle are regular monitored to have uh, feed and water. So they're going to look at um, feed testing, nutrient um, ration analysis. Are they working with nutritionists? Those are all ways producers can meet that outcome-based um, indicator. Um, so if you want to go to the next one, we also have an indicator um, related to sufficient water and quality. The beef codes of practice outlines very specifically um, things that need uh, outcomes that need to happen, uh, so to speak, how the producer does that in their context, um, specifically, again, um, is dependent on the operation. Next slide. Thanks, Anne. Um, so this one, again, cattle should be monitored uh, for an on ongoing basis. Um, and this is Monitor um, the beef code of practice outlines that they need to be monitored for like um, extreme weather events, heat, cold, um, monitoring for sick cattle or um, during times of high stress monitoring. Um, and I wanted to highlight this. This was during a big winter storm here, and um, I'm not really good at taking pictures, but a good friend um, took this as they. This is in her porch because the barn was full. They were bringing cats in during one of our ugly um, storm seasons. So. Again, it's one of those how the producer meets that outcome depends on the operation. They just need to be able to demonstrate it through those records, interviews, and assessments. The next one here, um, if you can go next slide. Um, animal health products are responsibly used and disposed. Again, um, the beef code of practice outlines what that is um, with some specifics that we've um, outlined in our indicators. We wanna see that um, uh, vet client relationship drugs are being used as um, responsibly and as on label as well as, um, as how they're disposing of them and then our next uh, slide here um, so again they're looking for things like does the operation use pain medication for castration or um, just um, dehorning does the operation consult with um, veterinarians um, um, so that's it um, and they're looking around those policies and processes and um, having those interviews with producers. Next slide. Um, and then we also, um, the code of practice outlines um, around um, euthanasia. So we actually are asked, um, it outlines quite specifically of what needs to happen, the training um, and making sure that producers have a plan in place and how they manage um, uh, sick animals or animals or and then the next slide. Um, again, so this is a unique indicator. Um, um, this is one of the fewer indicators that have only an achievement level. Anything less is unacceptable and anything more is unnecessary. So producers need to demonstrate adequate space shall be provided um, for cattle to express normal behavior. Um, and again, so that one's one I did want to highlight. And that is again, also based off our national Next slide. And then there's multiple pieces within the national code that talk about stress and how it manages under different situations. The CRSB and with the framework created one specific indicator around stress, but has multiple components um, that the um, 
farms to be evaluated depending on the farm and the different um, circumstances the farm's operating under. So um, we're evaluating um, the f facilities, um, how producers monitor that, looking at transportation, ensuring cattle are fit for transportation. Um, those pieces are um, part of our, all under that animal stress indicator. So although it's quite simple, what's being assessed is um, very deep as the end, um, looking at the context of the operation. But Kaylee, we're at time. Uh, well, and you've done it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that, okay. Uh, any last last words there? No, just if there, um, if people are interested, our, we do have our standard online as well as um, all of our documents um, interested in the national code and how it's um, created again online, we can connect them with those resources. But um, this allows to have this um, supply chain and fit those retailers needs here in Canada. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you all of the presenters. It's been really good to learn about the different systems around the world. Thank you to the brands and the retailers and everybody who's attended this call. I hope you have uh, learned a lot. I encourage you to get in touch with any of these folks. We will be sending the presentation out and the, and the, um, the slides and the recording will be posted on our hub. If you have any questions that you want us to direct to the individual speakers or in general, please contact us at Textile Exchange. Uh, responsible leather at textileexchange.org will get you to one of us. And other than that, I wish you a wonderful day. So thank you so much.